So this is the agenda. We have current statistics. I'll share some interesting things that I look at from an economic perspective. I usually read uh, what's going on in the economy with people's household incomes, spending, things like that. Uh, there's a little bit of a pop quiz. There's five questions. See if you guys know the answers to those. Uh, I wanted to show you um, a graph about a, a, actually a philosopher who talks about need versus want and aligning our brains before we get into how to establish a budget. Um, then there's uh, some interesting statistics about the psychology of cash versus credit that I've been observing that I wanted to share. We'll talk about financial goals, leadership, and health index, and then how to, uh, how to build a family budget and stay on track. So inshallah, we'll, we'll begin soon. So the current statistics uh, show that 60% of Americans don't, families, Americans don't have a budget, nor do they track their spending on a regular basis. This is a pretty shocking statistic to me. 43% of Americans have anxiety about not having an emergency fund for unanticipated expenses. Um, these are current stats on AOL, CNN Money. Anywhere you go, you can find a lot of these different polls and stats. 90% um, of families that earn $100,000 a year report that they could not go to the bank and give you $2,000 if they needed it as an emergency fund. Um, and this is why we're, we're actually doing this talk, because these are shocking statistics. 50% of divorce filings list that financial problems were a major root cause issue in the divorce, and it's the number one listed cause of major disagreements for, for families that have filed divorce. Um, going on a little bit more, the number one reason for middle-class family, families filing for bankruptcy, middle-class families, these are families that have jobs and probably possibly a little bit of savings, is, um, sorry, if I get behind, uh, the number one, reason for middle class families filing for bankruptcy is health care costs, unanticipated health care costs. Ten, twelve thousand dollars don't have it, have to file bankruptcy or get behind on credit cards. Uh, Thirty-seven percent of American families carry credit card debt from month to month. You just got killed. All right, I'll keep going. Uh, Americans are not taught financial literacy basics in schools. Only 17 states in America have a basic curriculum and it's an elective. It's not required so uh, teenagers and high school kids are not being even taught the basics. All right, rebooting. More Americans aged 18 to 35 live at home with their parents than any other time uh, since World War II. And that's because folks are getting out of school, get having lots and lots of debt. If they don't find the appropriate job, they just cannot manage a budget and get out of school and live on their own. So families cannot get started if people are still living at home and, and worried about money, especially young unmarried people. Um, so those are the basic statistics. I wanted to share a couple of econ graphs with you guys. We need to boot up the machine. So um, what does an economist do? So we look, es essentially, the difference between a business graduate and an econ economist is economics. We look at the philosophy of money, spending. We look at the, the early philosophers like Adam Smith and Malthus and the Keynesian philosophy, then we derive the theories, we spend a lot of time looking at statistics and econometrics, and then we look at analysis and we do research. So it's almost like a doctor who does research versus a doctor who lives with patients. So an economic person, an economist versus a business person, those are kind of the differences. So I look at a lot of technical graphs. I'm going to show you a couple of things that I see when I read the paper. I don't really need to read the headlines. I look at what's going on in the economy, kind of analyzing what's been going on. So this first graph here shows the month-to-month -month changes in savings rate, the red line, and you can see that savings rates actually go up and go down. And the reason why savings rates go up and go down is because the cost of the goods you buy, the bundle, we call that the consumer bundle, your organic milk, your gasoline, your tolls, your um, electricity costs, those things fluctuate. And they fluctuate at a, at, at, at a pretty rapid rate and those things affect your income. So now we use the term real disposable income. Not just income, but real disposable income. And disposable income is what you have left after you, say, after you pay all your bills. So real disposable income in this economy that is booming, everybody's looking at the Dow Jones and thinks everything's going great, but really there's several problems going on. If you look at the red graph, at the early part, the savings rate is only 5%. And then in, in 2017, it dips down at one point, it's actually zero. There's no red line. But all through that time, spending 
continues. So you're seeing Americans basically have very little savings, and now that the stock market is booming in 2017, we actually have the exact opposite of what we think. And what we think is everybody's getting wealthy. And what's really happening is people are getting behind. The blue line must be below the red line, and that's not happening. So this is a very interesting statistic, and these are the kinds of things that I look at. Don't be fooled by the news. The second line shows that, the black line shows that savings continues to drop. So at the very end of the black line on the right, you're seeing that savings rate is 2%. You look at the far left uh, top graph, I'll point it out. The black line is at 2%. Okay. And the purple line shows that people are getting wealthier and wealthier. But the folks that are, that are saving less and less are not on the blue line. They are not saving. The economy is not helping them. So if you say, oh, the economy is great, but you're not saving anything, you're getting behind someone else is getting better, or richer. So the rich are getting richer, and most people are getting saving less and getting poorer. So these are kind of economic stats. Uh, if you look at the, um, the, the write-ups at the top, you'll see the same thing. So here's a pop quiz. What are the three worst things you can do with your money? Number one, yeah. Yes, and not paying your uh, credit card in full, like for the time that's due rather than accumulate interest. Yeah, that's the month to month balance, but that's not, I'm talking about major, major things you can do. I, I guess I like stop buying coffee and lunch outside. <laughs> okay, the worst thing you, the third worst thing you can do with your money is going out to expensive restaurants. Food is food, and it ends up in the same place. Okay? Now, the second worst thing you can do with your money is buy a new car. The second you drive it off the lot, you are behind. You've paid taxes, your loan is higher than its value. You now have a liability that is greater than its value. The, the greatest, the worst thing you can do with your money is buy, when you have a house, buy another house and change houses. If you look at the 3% that you pay your real estate agent and the 3% the other guy gets, and you look at the change in value of buying an expensive house and the tax burden on it, it is shocking. You have to really do the true math, okay? You have to do, be, do the true math, okay? If you buy a $500,000 house and you turn around and buy a $700,000 house, your expenses could double. You don't realize they're gonna double, but they can double because of your tax burden. And the amount, if you've lost $80,000, $90,000 right there, if you put that in the bank, if you put that in stocks that are halal, inshallah, halal stocks, we're not talking about bonds, you could do a lot better. That's a lot of money you've given up. Can I go back? Oh, so um, how long does it take to pay off a 10% credit card with an $8,000 balance if you just make the minimum payments? Anybody want to guess? The number's not even there. It's 32 years. Okay, I actually saw this as an advertisement in a bank. They're that crazy that they're, they're thinking that this is 32 years is, is, is an advertising. Yeah, jump on, borrow $8,000 and keep paying off for 30. That's one vacation you pay off for 32 years. It's crazy. You have to know the math of how those minimum payments work. Uh, when you take a 30 year mortgage on a $700,000 house, how many years does it take for you to own half your house? Does anybody know? Not 30 years. No, so 30 years, you, you've paid it off, you own it. Oh, yeah, so 15. 23, 22 full years to pay off. So you, uh, on the year 23, you own half the house. So the first 22 years, all you've done mostly is pay debt, pay interest. Okay, so it's an interest game. But the bank gets fed first before your principal gets accumulated. The next thing is the average family carries blank in rolling credit card debt, uncollateralized credit card debt. That's called uncollateralized. I would say 12K. 16K, the average US family. Okay. If you have $100 earning 10% interest for five years, just a math problem, I'm not advocating interest. Do you, after five years, does your balance equal more or less, more or less than 150 or equal to 150? Mathematicians, engineers, answer is more than 150, right? Because the first year you get 100, you get 10% on 100, then you've got 11, uh, 1,000, 
a 110. Then you get interest on the 110, so you, you end up with about 160, okay? You have to know that this math works for you because you can accumulate more, or it works against you because your debt is accumulating faster. So either way, so it's the... Okay, so this is now shifting gears a little bit. This, this pyramid uh, was, uh, was brought to light by Alexander Maslow. He's a philosopher. In 1943, he created this thing called the Maslow's Hierarchy of Human Needs. And this is a very important graph because it should align with your priorities. It should tell you what's important and what's not when you go shopping. The first thing you need to do is meet your physiological needs. Warmth, shelter, clothing, fire, wood, energy, okay? What happens to a person when they're in the forest? They spend most of their time looking for food and looking for warmth. The next thing they do is safety, safety needs. The next thing they do is one, your safety, when you've got your physical needs met and you've got some safety, then you look for love and belonging, community. After that, you look for self-esteem, and after that, you look for self-actualization. So these are very important. So what the, the marketing industry wants you to do is forget about the safety needs, the long-term planning, the health, and the property. Line number two, and go out and buy things like fancy cars. And so, you know, these are, the, these are the things that the marketing industry specializes in getting you to do. They're getting you to not follow this basic pyramid. That's why a lot of people don't have any savings, but then they have a fancy car. They just go out and lease a car. They're driving a brand new Audi A3. You know, you don't have any money for your safety needs. You haven't secured the pyramid. It's upside down pyramid. So what happens? So this is a very important graph. I actually have this graph as a, as a picture on my phone. So it reminds me what is important. So it's very important for you guys to become familiar anytime just type in Google Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's something you should look at and this is how you build a budget. So we'll get to that eventually inshallah. So now we're moving into psychology. So the psychology of cash versus credit. So I wanted to, to show you some interesting statistics about what happens in our brains when we take cash away from us and start using plastic. So there's a vending machine, a national vending machine company that says that their sales jumped 100, up by 178% as soon as they change their cash machines to card machines. People will just spend more, okay? Uh, and that's a shocking number. The American Express gold card came out in 1982 and people were so proud of it because it made them feel special over the green card that they were willing to have a, a minute more a higher balance and willing to pay higher interest rates. American Express discovered that by accident. They were just trying to change the color of their card and they realized they could change the color of the card and make it and charge more. Um, studies show that everyone spends at least the most stringent strict person will spend between 12 and 18 percent more when they go to the store with cash versus credit. It's statistically proven. Uh, They've done brain scan experiments on people and they plug them into brain machines while they go and shop. And if they have cash and they pay for things, they actually have a, a pain center that's activated in the brain. And if those same people go with the brain scan and they use a credit card, nothing happens. So it, it neutralizes your, you, you value cash. You know, look at cash. If I give cash, if I buy a shirt and I give cash, something less is in my wallet. If I buy a shirt and I give her a credit card, I get the credit card back and the shirt. You see that? There's something going on. We don't know what it is, but innately, it's very, very psychologically driven. Um, Disney hotels, casinos, cruises, if you've ever been to any of those places, they don't want you to use cash. The second you enter the door, they want you to give your credit card on a tab and your Coke and your meals, everything, your stores, everything is just, you just put it on your room. You just put it on your room card. And later on you get the bill, you're like, whoa, what happened? I did that at a cruise when I went with my kids. We were paying $2.50 for a Coke. Normally on the street we would pay 75 cents. So they overcharge for everything and you don't even know. And then you get the bill later. Um, the CEO of, uh, of Visa said that we are at war with cash as it is a direct competitor to our business. A, they charge, the, the, they charge Target and B, they charge you. They're charging on money on both ends for you to use your money. It's really a sick game. 
They're the richest people in the world. These companies are the top of the S&P 500. Well, so, what do you hmm? mean when they charge you? Well, they charge the vendor who's selling. Yeah. So if I'm if I'm a store and I'm charging, and I'm using Visa, they they per, they pay a percentage for Visa to use for them to use Visa, and you pay interest on what you use. So both the vendor and the, and the buyer are getting charged. Yeah. Just one of the comments. So like now I see like vendors like wanting to like avoid the three percent. So they'll have a note saying we will be charging you three percent if you use your credit card. I know that's yeah. legal. Well, they, they can. See that. Yeah. As long as they tell you, sure. They just charge you three percent more, right? So this is very important that we realize what's going on. And you know what they do? The financial convenience. It's a financial insurance. It gives you flexibility. You know. So you don't have to go to the, you don't have to go to the, uh, the, the teller machine and get your money. No, you want to go to the teller machine and get your money because then you can budget, right? That inconvenience helps you. It doesn't harm you. They want you to think it helps you. Okay, so the, the bottom is not showing up, but basically it says cash is what you value psychologically. You feel the pinch when you give it up. Can I ask a question here or can I ask Sure, sure. Uh, are we doing on time? Close to this kind of topic of credit. So the way these things are, I mean, you know, we've been told, you know, you know, when you use credit card or thing, your credit score goes up because you're paying and all that stuff. So and everything is credit driven, right? You go and buy a house, a car, or you know, these. So it, how, how does that kind of uh, uh, relate to that uh, when you go and pick or maybe borrow money? Because your credit score impacts them. That's a, that's, sorry to cut you off, that's just a distraction. So yeah, it's not hard for a high schooler who has no credit history to go get credit. It's not hard. Mm -hmm. So why are they getting you caught up and distracted in this score game? Mm -hmm. Because you're thinking about the score and not the true cost. Mm -hmm. Live the life you want, not the life they want. That's, 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 the, that's the, the gist of this talk. Live the life you want, not the life they want. Right. Just I'm sorry. a quick add to that. So it's interesting that you mentioned that because actually I have a score or I had a score of 750. I did try to go to the bank and get a loan, but my income didn't match the sort of like, even though the um, score was high. So I, I realized that later as a lesson of what you just said, it's just like kind of like a gimmick. Because yeah, okay. like if your income doesn't match, or even your credit score is super high, like they won't give you a loan. So it's just like, I'm yeah. like, why should I my it's, you're, They're doing you a favor if they don't give you a loan. You go get cash. You'll buy it. In the old days, you used to have three choices. Buy it on cash, buy it on installment, or okay, buy it on credit card. Very few people carried credit cards. And you built, you bought it on installment. If you didn't have the money, you take it home when you've paid for it. A layaway. They call it layaway. So there's things in this society that have to happen very quickly. So let me finish this thought. So you can't read it, but you feel the pinch when you give it up. Credit cards remove you from the feedback mechanism of pain. Using cash is the only surefire way to budget. Right? It's in your hands. You see it decline. Right? If you if you are if you're really mathematically inclined and you're really really strict, you can budget with a credit card. But you have to walk around with a calculator every time and keep a slip. You have to do that. There's no other way you're going to do that. You have to be extremely disciplined, and you're still going to spend 12 to 18 percent more. It's just proven. So recalibrate your thinking. So the whole point of the, the previous slide was to try to give you a real picture of what's going on. And, and this is, the questions are good because you get distracted. A credit card it is an instant jet debt generation device. That's what it really is. You're signing, you've just taken debt. And you have an accountability lag. It doesn't show you what you've done for a month. And you don't know what the calculation is unless you're like a mathematician. You go, can you walk around and keep track of all the interest that's being accrued on your credit card while you're shopping in a mall? No. So do that for a week. You won't know what the number is. You won't be able to budget. So see the credit card for what it really is. A debit card is something different. We're talking about credit cards. Need versus want. So we talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We really need to understand. You're bombarded with 10,000 messages a day which are scientifically proven and designed to make you want. Right? Sheikh Hamza said he studied the media and I listened to a talk of he said before in the 1920s the Sears catalog told you how uh, something was made and how long it lasted. Then they got more sophisticated they started telling you oh other wives have it, other husbands have it. So it was like keeping up with the Joneses. 
And then media got more savvy, and now it's about emotion. I saw a Nissan ad where, or a Volkswagen ad during the Super Bowl where the kid's wearing a Darth Vader mask and he's, you know, he's um, pushing this on the car and the guy has a starter in his wallet and he starts the car because the kid's doing the force field in the car. It makes the kid happy. So they're, they're now, the advertising is playing with your emotions. It's getting more and more sophisticated, right? Um, there's a, so this talk is based on Dave Ramsey. I don't know if you guys have heard of Dave Ramsey. He's been on the Oprah show. He's kind of like the Dr. Phil of money. Mm -hmm. And you should familiarize with yourself with him. Most of the principles are here. My understanding here was to, check, it was to introduce you to Dave Ramsey, but because we're short on time, I'm not gonna click on the link. But he says in this talk, don't join the cult of Apple. It's great if you have money, buy an iPhone. But they want you to join a cult. They want you to think that you're better than a Samsung person. You're not. A Google person is different from an Apple person. We're all the same. Forget it. This is a cult. They want you to join cults and feel like you're in these cults. Um, so we're going to talk now. The last three bullets are really examine your feelings about money. What may have influenced you? So for instance, I came from an immigrant family. And my father has a horrible story about how the second he arrived in America, he had to spend half his money on a coat because it was freezing outside and he lost his jacket. That story sticks with me. And we, our first car that he bought was from this Turkish guy in New York. He didn't have a back seat. So he bought a cheap car, a used car, and we had to go to the junkyard and get a seat because my father had to budget. So I grew up in a budgeting family. Some people grew up in a family where they were very wealthy. Money was no object. They had fun. They went on vacations and the parents never bothered. Some people grew up in tribulation. They were poor or they got kicked out of their homes. These things affect you, okay? So please examine what, where your feelings about money come from and what your feelings about money really are. <clears throat> then that's the first step, okay? Uh, explore what money is and what it means to you. Does it make you happy? I had a college roommate who was in debt and the second he made a few bucks, he would just go buy himself a treat. And I was sitting there going, what the heck is going on? But I realized for him, he came from a poor family and he, did, he was always gonna be poor. He had enough school debt, so he didn't care. He just, he needed to be happy. He gave himself a treat. When spring break happened, he went on vacation. He didn't think twice. When spring break happened, I went and lived at my cousin's house and ate their food. You know, I mean, we had different philosophies and we were really good friends, you know. Um, understand what makes you happy. Again, they want you to go to the mall and buy to be happy, right? So, so let's, let's, let's fix that. And then the next thing you need to do is whatever your feelings are, you need to share them with a spouse and your partner, okay? How many people actually have a premarital talk about money? How many couples do that? It's very, very rare. You can go on the website and see 100 questions to ask about money, 100 questions to ask before you get married, 30 questions you need about money, it's all there. These, this is the summary right here. Career, talk about career and retirement. Are both the, the husband and wife gonna work? Does she want a career? Okay, it's very important. Who's gonna, who's gonna pay the bills? Are you gonna have joint accounts? Very, very important. I can tell you horror stories, personal horror stories of people I know. Uh, debts, what are your current and future feelings about debt? What is your school loan situation? You know, do you want to spend 40000 on a wedding? You know, that's, you know that, that's a big question. Big ticket items, house and cars. Do you, have, do you want to buy a house or do you want to keep up with the Joneses and, oh, it's, it's in this neighborhood, but that neighborhood's cool, so five years later we're going to buy a bigger house. This is just a starter home. That's what I hear. Oh, we're just buying a starter home. Yeah, because you're going to throw your money away and buy three more homes. Buy the home you want to grow in. Uh, big ticket items, savings, investments, emergencies, and risk. Okay, These are, this is the next category of questions you need to have with the potential spouse. Raising and educating kids, are they going to go to private school or public school? Or do you want, does a husband want the wife to stay home and homeschool and she wants a career? That's a big issue. Parent and sibling obligations. Some people send money back home. You don't know until you have these questions asked. How much money is going to go back home? Um, entertainment and vacations. What do you see as entertainment? Is it going to the park or is it going to Disneyland for, for a weekend and staying on, on, their, on, their, on their dime, you know, feeding Mickey? You know, so these are the premarital talk. I hope you all had them. 
Uh, one of the things I benefited from was my wife was in LA and I was in San Francisco when we got engaged. We spent a lot of time talking on the phone. And we didn't plan to do this, but you know, she's a very verbal person. <laughs> and we, I, I actually checked the box. We actually talked about all these things. In just in general, we did, but we got lucky. We're very, very lucky. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so now that you, as a couple, any, any company that's run, you know, has a board, and then they have a vision, then they have goals, then they have objectives, then they have execution and tasks, right? Every company, if you, if you came to me and said, I want to work for a company, I said, I don't have a vision, I don't have goals, I don't have tasks, just invest in my company, you'd be out of here. But as a families, we do that all the time. We don't have goals, we don't have vision, we don't have strategy, we don't have execution, and we don't have agreement. That's, that's really, really strange. And most families have to have this. And it's a difficult conversation because, it, it, you know, where are you going to get if you don't have agreement? And one person, the sunnah is, you have shura, you, you, you talk about something, you take consultation, and then there's an amir. And that person is responsible. So in your family, you have to have a CFO. And that CFO should not be treated like the bad guy. That CFO should be, yes, you're the CFO, we're all on track, we know what to do. We do it at work. I can't hire two more people if I want to. I have to listen to my boss. She's managing the budget. But somehow we think at home we can call each other, you're cheap and you're stingy, you won't get your way. We need to be on track. Okay? So, um, as a couple, do you understand the feelings about career? Do you have a designated leader who's the Amir and the family CEO? What are your feelings and comfort level with debt? So each person may have a very different view of debt. One person may be super, super religious and conservative and say, we cannot have any debt. I'll rent a house. The other person will say, oh, you know what? I looked on Chef Google and, you know, loans are okay. You know, we don't know, but you've got to figure that out. Um, what is the budget and the consumption philosophy of the family? Um, have the, the fifth bullet's very important. Have the budgets and goals been discussed openly with the whole family? Don't treat your children like they don't know. Treat them with respect and talk to them and tell them why are we spending? Why can't we buy this? Why can't we go to Disneyland yet? Uh, we'll go on vacation when I get my bonus. They, if they understand the whys, they will comply. If they don't understand the whys, they won't, they won't know and they won't comply. So treat them with respect and teach them about money as they're younger. They will, they will surprise you with how much they know. I, I remember my father and mother talking about budgets and my father would say no and it would be okay. And he kept a strict budget. But then we were able to get things as we grew as a family, as his income grew. Um, so that's the, that's the page. Um, put, your family, put your family first. Like I said, live the life you need to live for your family, not the life they want you to live. So this is the financial health index. Hopefully everybody's got this 899 point score where the needle is. But uh, again, I just wanted to give credit where credit is due. There's Dave, Dave Ramsey's financial coaching. And I got these images from a website. And I want to give credit to the Storehouse Financial Solutions. You can go there and look at these images. But they have a plan. You know, they'll charge you money, but, but, but they'll get you on track. And uh, I'm sharing the same information with you. <clears throat> so financial, <clears throat> financial health scoring. If you look from the bottom up, look at these, uh, what, these, what this uh, um, actually, uh, what this uh, thing says about the family. So each family condition is described and says client does not, the, this is critical, client does not meet any financial health standards, is financially unstable, and is under extreme financial stress. Those people are likely to get sick. Those people are likely to have strokes. And then they'll have health care costs. Okay, it says here consistent scores in this range are doubtful towards improvement and may be a candidate for bankruptcy. So these are, these are the different places where a family can be and you want to be improving. What is your state and how do you get to the next station? Sheikh Hamza talked about this many years ago. In religion, it's like, where are you with Allah and how can you get better? You always be improving. And this is the same situation. They just don't talk about religion, but the same situation. Where are you? And how can you take steps to get to the next level? Climb the ladder. Climb the ladder for yourself and to keep 
your family out of debt. It's a very dangerous situation. And inshallah, once you do a great job, you're now putting away money for your college so your kids aren't debt ridden when they go to college. You can help them out. Yeah, let's, let's wait. Let's keep going through. Uh, I think the time here, we've got to actually stop for Isha, but then we can continue. Yeah, we can come back after Isha. Yeah, so I don't know if people are online, inshallah they are. Yeah. So, uh, so building blocks of financial health. So I just threw this out there. This is from the RAP. You've got to map a plan, master the process, and measure. So in every, any company, you have a board meeting, you have a budget, and then you have metrics. Yeah, key performance indicators, KPIs, metrics. So the third part is it doesn't happen any day. It happens week to week as you're spending. So so if you're going to have a budget and you're going to do this, it's a, it's a long process. Okay, But you can do it. It's very, very actually easy. And I've got the tools here to show you and show. Um, again, the, the first part you do, number 01, is cash flow management. How much are you spending on rent? How much are you spending on daily bills? Revenue versus costs on a monthly basis. And you've got to watch your grocery bills every week. It's a weekly job. Number two, if you're not, if you're not on, if you haven't done 01, 02, and 03, it goes back, back to that graph where I said, if you're on the black line, you're not on the blue line. If you're not a saver, you're not making investment income. Okay? So if you're not doing 01, 02, and 03, your, the economy is not helping you. You're just surviving and you're teetering. Okay, and then there's two ways you can earn money, right? One is with your body, your mind, and your time. And the other way is passive income, your investments. So while you're sleeping, while Warren Buffett sleeps, he makes money. Okay, Trump passes a tax bill, he's $600,000 richer. It's, he's got passive income. So if you're not doing one, two, and three, and getting to four, you're not, you don't have any passive income. And that's, how you that's what you retire on. That's what you send your kids to college on. So inshallah, we can get there. So the basics of a financial budget. This is from Dave Ramsey also. This is a budget breakdown of what your expectation should be. It's ranges. If you add up all the ranges, 25, 10, 5, the lower ones all the way down, it equals 85%. So if you can stick to that, you'll be saving 15%. But it's hard to do. I mean, organic milk is expensive. Gasoline just went up. So you have to, mon you have to understand real income versus versus accounting income. Yeah, you made $100,000, but gasoline just went up 50% and you commute two hours a day. That, you just became poorer. You got a $300 raise, but tolls went up, and gas went up, and BART went up. You, you just got poorer. You have to then go to this budget and lower the expenses that you pay. You have to find a way to do that. And you have to find a way to protect your family. So really think about not income, but real disposable income and what your savings rate is. The 80-20 rule, pay yourself 20% first, live on the 80%. If you can do that, you will succeed. Inshallah, you'll build it up, build it up. That takes discipline, especially in California and San Francisco. Okay, so for income statement, I don't want to use the fancy words, but this is an income statement. Think revenues versus costs. Okay, so this is how you build a budget. You can, buy, you can download lots of apps. If you go to Dave Ramsey, he has a budget app. You put in your numbers, and you can have an app every month. and put your numbers in. So I took this from one of his apps, and you can have that. This is how you build an income statement. You do this every month, and be sure to also think about taxes and deductions. The first line there, a lot of people don't think about that. They think they make $100,000. No, they only make seventy. And that's if you're doing a good job. Okay, is this a good place to stop because it shows up? We can go a couple more slides. Okay, think assets versus liability. So a lot of people say, well, should I lease a car or buy a car? Buying a car goes in the left column. Leasing a car goes in the right column. Assets over liabilities gives you net worth. So if you buy a $10,000 Corolla that's used with 40,000 miles on it, you can lower the insurance premium. Not only do you have a car you're paying off, but you pay cheaper insurance. The same monthly payment you go buy a $20,000 brand new Corolla, 
you pay $2,000 in tax, so it becomes $22,000. You have to pay the highest insurance premium because the bank owns it and you don't own it. And it actually costs you a third to half more, and it's a liability. You lease it. It's the same payment, right? The car will see the same payment. You can buy an old Corolla for $120 a month loan, or you can buy a new, lease a new Corolla for $120 a month. But you have mileage restrictions, you don't own the asset, and you have to pay the higher insurance premium. So your real cost is much higher for leasing the car. And at the end of the day, if your used car, you pay it off in four years, you can drive it for another six years. Corollas last forever, okay? It doesn't look cool, but your bank looks cool. You're not in critical, you're not in red. You get up to the green. Then when you get up to the green, you get to the blue. And when your score is 899, go buy a Jaguar. Go buy a Lexus. That's how you do it, okay? This is the, this is the method, so keep thinking. If you, I always buy, if I'm buying a durable good, I never impulse buy. I sleep on it for three nights. Okay? Really, really, what psychologically things are going on in my brain before I go buy this car? Really. And I love BMWs, okay? But I won't buy a new one. I'm a car guy. I got car magazines for 30 years. I used to get a car magazine in subscription. That's crazy. Now, like, what was that? <laughs> I had motorcycles too. I was like, now I'm like, why was I driving a motorcycle? It's killing myself, you know? You just get into this weird psychology. Like, I want to be a motorcycle dude. And you're, you're dead, you know? I got stolen, and I was like, I cried for a day, and then I realized, oh my God, it probably saved my life. Someone stole my bike. Mm -hmm. um, so this is Dave Ramsey's baby steps. So number one, number one thing, get your monthly budget in order, and step one, get $1,000 cash saved up. Just do it before you even pay your credit cards. Just do the minimum payment, get $1,000 in the bank. Your car repairs, medical, you know, deductible, make sure you have medical insurance if you can. Get a, get a less sexy job, less high paying job with medical benefits. Because, you know, young people get sick, not just old people. Number two, baby step number two, pay off debt, okay? Pay off debt using, the, he, he calls it the debt snowball method. So pay off your smallest credit cards first. Just get rid of them, if the rates are comparable. But to me, pay off the credit cards that have the highest interest rate first. And Audu Billah, I mean, this is not a religious talk, I'm not gonna quote Hadith, I'm not a scholar. Audu Billah, pay them off. And with the niyyah of paying them off and pleasing Allah. He will help, Allah will help you, Allah can do anything. Um, I've seen many, many, I've heard many, many stories, first-hand stories of people who made Tawbah and it happened for them. But if Sheikh Google, if you're going to Sheikh Google and he's saying you can take loans, then, then, then you know, you, you listen to who you want to listen to. Number three, three to six months of expenses and savings, okay? That's a lot of money for most people. 4,000, people are paying $4,000 for a rented house here, 3,000 is nothing. That's a lot of money, but you gotta save it because you can be you can be out of a job very quickly. There has not been a recession in America for the last nine years. And in economics, we're taught there's a correcting cycle every seven years. We're literally waiting for an economic earthquake. It it is imminent, okay? And uh, what what's going on in the stock market? I don't know. I'm an economist, and I don't know. So please, just try to, to, to have a rainy day. This is called your rainy day fund. And I've been out of a job. There was a time when I lost my job between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I couldn't pay my mortgage, all right? That was a bad, bad situation, okay? It just, you know, you know, huh? Eight o'clock, okay. So we'll come back. There's only a few more slides. If you guys have to leave, thank you for attending. Inshallah, we'll pray Isha, and then start again. Dave Ramsey, is a, he has a national syndicated radio, but he's also Christian, family values, conservative. One of the things I wanted you to notice is that he has charity in here. He's got a space for charity. So he budgets charity into his, um, into his budget, and he recommends for all the Christian families to do that. Of course, we have zakat, we have sadaka. So I, I forgot to mention that. I, I did want to definitely mention that about him. Um, he's a great guy to listen to. Uh, uh, one of the, so a personal story, I want to tell a personal story. I have a coworker whose um, brother worked, 
worked, uh, made $80,000, and they lived in a, in a very small town. And they had three kids, and him not knowing his wife uh, bought $80,000 worth of stuff, uncollateralized credit card debt, and he never knew it. So he came home one day, and he saw these bills in the paper, in the, these bills going into the garbage can after years, and he realized, he opened it up, and then uh, for some reason she would unplug the phone because the, the creditors were starting to call her because she couldn't make payments. She just went shopping sprees. And it turns out that she had spent $80,000 and he didn't know it. Okay. So they went to, um, almost got a divorce. He had to figure out what to do. Uh, turns out she was a child of divorce. And what her parents did was in order to make her happy, they bought her stuff. And she was home alone. He was working long hours over time. He used to work in a PG&E gas line. He's a welder, so he used to be on shift all the time. So his 80,000 was like more like 100,000. But she was home alone with the kids and she needed to keep them happy, so she spent money and she didn't tell him. So they never had that talk. So this exact same story happened on Oprah. And Dave Ramsey was there. And Dave Ramsey and Oprah had a fight because Oprah wanted to make the show about the victim. And Dave Ramsey's argument was, the husband is not a victim. He's also at fault. And the reason he's at fault is well, it's something that I've already covered, which is they needed to have an understanding. Like, how can you be so blind that stuff's coming in the house, your kids are wearing Gap, your kids are wearing Banana Republic. I mean, something's gotta give, right? You, you've gotta open your eyes and notice, and you've gotta have a conversation. So, A, he didn't have a conversation bad on him. B, he didn't even notice what was going on. He just assumed she was buying according to the budget and they never talked about the budget. So that's an interesting story. Um, the other thing I have, like uh, we know personal story, the husband, the wife and the husband both work. They have kids, okay? The husband talks to his friends about nothing but stocks. Always investments, investments, investments. He wants to buy a Tesla, okay? She comes, the wife comes and complains about it because she wants, before the kids are older, to go on a family vacation. When she brings it up with him, he thinks it's a ridiculous idea because it'll throw their investments off and he won't be able to buy his Tesla. So they have a major disagreement. You know, the wife wants to do something with the family, with the kids. The husband, it's all about money. It's all about his goals. His friends are all, all his friends are about money. All his friends are about stocks. All his friends are about these toys. And that's what they're, you know, sitting and complaining about this stuff because they don't have internal agreement. It's very, very sad to see. How is that marriage going to survive, right? when two people are on such different trajectories. Okay. Another coworker of mine, she was divorced, had a daughter, she married this rich doctor, and he charges her rent. So he has a really nice house in Arinda that he bought land, he built, he only owed like $8,000 $80, to his mom. So he's got this house paid for her, so he charges her rent because they should be equal partners, right? She, had, she came in with $15,000 of debt, he charges her rent, and, and makes three times more than her. And then he has all the money and she's supposed to pay the expenses because she has two mouths to feed. It's her and her daughter. So he basically counts the money that her daughter is, is, is the food that she's eating. So this is going on in America. I mean, I'm in corporate America. These are people who work for me. These are their stories. This is real. Um, and uh, I have another story of uh, a wife who every time she meets with her friend, husband, her husband provides, they have many kids, three, four kids. I don't want to say anything so that people know who I'm talking about. And they rent a house, okay? He, he's, he's doing a good job. But every time she meets with her friends, they, 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 they're like, oh my God, you don't own here? You gotta own, you gotta own. Why are you guys living in this neighborhood? You know, and so every time she meets with her friends, she feels horrible. She feels like her husband is not providing for her, not doing her right. But at the same time, he's a good husband, he's working, they're paying rent. They have an internal agreement for whatever reason they didn't buy. But she feels horrible every time she, she meets and sits down with her friends. What kind of friends are people? You know, they're making each other, not supporting each other, tearing each other down. But these are real, real stories. So I wanted to share a couple of those stories. Um, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, be content. So if, if your husband brings home something and you have a $10,000 Corolla and it's used, it's got 100,000 miles and it's running, be content with that. He's doing what he's supposed to do. He's bringing it home. And if it's not in your risk and you're doing what you can, be content with it, 
work on your own heart. Don't work on destroying him when he's doing something right for you. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. The worst thing you can do is when someone's doing something right and you criticize it. Not when they're doing something wrong. A lot of people will criticize you when you're doing something right, but if you're criticizing somebody for doing something right, for standing up, being a man, providing for his family, working hard, you see him going out every day, and you tear him down for that, that's horrible. The same way if a wife cooks food and the husband like, this tastes like junk. She's doing what she's supposed to do. She's making effort to, to do something right and then be criticized for it. That's how you tear people apart. And there's a lot of people who live under financial stress. And we want to make sure that we have healthy families because healthy families build a solid building block for healthy communities. Right? Um, the first woman who went on Social Security, first woman who was paid the first dollar from Social Security, 42 working people supported her check. Now, Social Security, six people earn for every one person that gets a check. 42 to 1 was the ratio. That's a solid Social Security plan. That's what America had when Social Security started. Now there's six people who earn enough to pay for Social Security. It's upside down. How are we going to pay these obligations? The average American is $60,000 in debt because of our $20 trillion debt. The average taxpayer is $170,000 in debt because of our $20 trillion debt. That's what's going on in this country. So these are the economic foundation of things that are going on. These are the short stories I wanted to share um, to shed light on and what, what's really going on. It's, there's like a tsunami, it's, a, it's an earthquake, and we need to get our families right, inshallah, and our couples uh, uh, together when they, when they get married. Um, so charity was in this, uh, in this slide, and then we talked about income statement, revenues and costs. We talked about balance sheet, assets versus liabilities. Um, this is the baby steps. So we covered baby step one, which is get a thousand dollars emergency fund. Number two, um, pay off your debt in the snowball method. So highest interest rates first, right? Or smallest, if it's all equal, smallest credit cards first. Just pay it off, rip it up. Pay it off, rip it up. Okay. Number three. Sorry, like for number two, does that, I guess that's a good big purchase, like the brand new cars or two, like. Yeah, yeah. If you've got one with hundred dollars and one with ten thousand, and they're both the same rate, pay that hundred dollar one off, get it out of there. You know, that's the snowball method. Number three, three to six months. That's a lot of money. So you've got to have a plan, and the plan is try to save fifteen to twenty percent. Try to save fifteen to twenty percent. Uh, budget the heck out of your family. And if you need to move to a smaller place, move to a smaller place. Do you need that extra bedroom when you're sick with anxiety and fear? You can have a stroke and then you won't be able to provide for your family. There are so many diseases that happen because people are sick with stress. Jobs are stressful enough, commute is stressful enough, you know, coming home you barely get enough rest and then on top of that you're going to put financial crisis stress on your body. It's not a good situation. It's not a good situation. I had a stressful job for seven, it was a really stressful job for seven years. There were days when I thought like my heart would just stop in its cavity. Okay, that's enough stress. Alhamdulillah, I'm fine here. <laughs> you know, layer that on top and people are just really sick. Okay, and then healthy food. You know, it's just, you, you, if, you're, if you're that tired and worn out, you're just gonna please your body with food and then you're gonna get sicker. So it's a snowball effect, try to be healthy. Healthy financially means healthy physically. Uh, step number uh, number four. So start investing. So once you're in the uh, saving category, you can get into the investing and passive income category. So start investing. Invest in growth stocks. We're not talking about receiving interest income here. That's not what Muslims should be doing. They should be investing in growth stocks. So invest in Nabisco, invest in Apple, invest in stocks that appreciate, give you an income, not which give you uh, interest, so stay away from bonds, right? Stocks, income stocks, bond, not bonds, right? Mm -hmm. Not T-bills, so there's all these, all these, uh, there's two real categories, stocks and bonds, right? Um, and if you have any specific questions, of course, I'm trying to get the MCC to set up like a financial counseling, we can do classes, workshops, but more it's one-on-one, -on -one. you can't really do that much in a workshop because everybody's situation is, is, is individual. Um, number two, as soon as you're doing well in step four, that's for you and your family, start setting up your children for success. 
You know, are you going to send them to Yale for thirty four, thirty forty thousand dollars a year because they can get in, so you can brag to your friends? Are you going to send them to Sac State? You know, they still teach you two plus two at Sac State. It equals four. Okay, if you're doing it for your friends, pony up and give them more money. You want to send them to Yale so you can brag? Give them more money. Okay, if you want to send them up, set them up with the education set them up with the education and teach them the value of money from the time they're three years old and teach them how to work, make them get a job, and send them to school. Make sure you do all those things. Teach them about money, make them work when they're in high school, and then let them go to college and build a resume as well as a, a, a curriculum resume. Don't let them have all these amazing degrees on their uh, resume and have no job experience. They don't know anything. And they don't know the value of a dollar, and they're in debt. And then they're living with you, and they're 34 years old. Audhu billah. Let's let's get to a better plan, really. Okay, and 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 let's think. Let's think about that. Let's think about who's influencing us. Okay. Imam Tahir was here. He said, if he, he said it, I was like, I thanked him. Said, hey, he said, if they gave my son a free ride to Harvard and Yale, I would not send my son to Harvard and Yale. A, they're not ready at 18 to go that far away. That's a different conversation. But B, people are, people are letting their kids go into massive amounts of debt because they're proud of them. You know? And, and you know, you, you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. I know people have great degrees from Columbia. They make $200,000 a year. They can't save anything in New York City. You know, if you live in New York City, you can't. You know, and they're working Saturday, Sunday. They're coming home at 11 p.m. at night. You, you, your real wage, your real wage is the same as a Subway sandwich maker, right? If you look at your real wage, if you're putting 80 hours a week and you're making $60,000 a year, you're making the same amount of money as a $30,000 employee, right? Because you're putting in double the time, right? So think about your real wage, your real time, your real leisure, okay? So after you, it's the kids, okay? And then get that house paid off. Okay, anything can happen to you or your spouse. Okay, anything can happen, especially if you're earners. We're all at risk. You know, our, we don't know how long we've got. So play, pay off your debt, pay off your house. You know, and a family vacations are important. Of course, you should budget for that. It's really good for them. But your priority is to do both, not just one. And you know, I, I see 55, 60 year old guys buying a new house. I'm like, what are you doing? That's another 30 years. Okay, if you're wealthy, great. I don't know, maybe they're wealthy, but if they're extending their debt till they're 70, they're going to be working till they're 70. Hopefully they're paying it off. I don't know. But I always question, like, what's wrong with the home you're leaving? You just gave $90,000 to two real estate brokers and they're living really well. Number seven, build wealth. Give a bunch away. That's the bottom line. Sorry, here. This is again. MashaAllah, Dave Ramsey, right? He said, once you're wealthy, you can help the community. You can help other people. But if you're teetering, you're on the brink of needing help. So, you know, give charity, give sadaqah, but make sure your house is in order so that you're not looking for, for a handout later. And that's the problem. It's like, hey, I'm doing really well, and all of a sudden, somebody helped me. You know, you didn't take care of business when you, when you take care of business. So alhamdulillah, you know, I mean, do you need that iPhone X? Really? I mean, you need to join the cult of Apple. I actually, if I see someone with an iPhone 4, I go shake their hand. I'm like, mashallah, you can keep an iPhone 4 working. You, you, you're a really, really amazing person. You know, there's a lady at work, she has an iPhone 4. I'm like, wow, that is cool. You are really cool. Because she's keeping that thing working. If she upgrades it, it's gone, it's going to blow up. You know, so alhamdulillah, we should be praising people for doing the right thing. So uh, Warren Buffett is famous. What does he do? Going back to that line, what makes you happy? You know what he does to be happy? Does anyone know what he does to be happy? He lives in Omaha. He lives in the same house. He does that. He lives in Omaha. He lives in the same house. He drives a Camry. He goes to work every day. Does what he loves. It's worth forty billion dollars. And when he wants a treat, he buys himself a dairy. What is it called? Um, dairy ice cream cone and he plays he loves to play um, 
He loves to play uh, that computer card game. I don't know what it's called. Bridge. I think it's Bridge. He plays online with some lady every day for like two hours. So he knows how. To, he knows what it takes to make him happy. It doesn't cost him any money. He has forty billion dollars. He runs Berkshire Hathaway. I don't know what it's called. I think that's what it is. Right? So simple play. He knows what makes him happy, and he buys it, but it doesn't cost him anything. That's Warren Buffett. Um, add something to that last Sure, sure. Um, one of the things that always like just messes with my mind is how we as Muslims don't budget because how else are you going to pay your zakat or know if you're the recipient of zakat if you mm. don't even know mm. what yeah. that is year to year. Yeah. And uh, another pet peeve of mine that's related to that is if people aren't paying their zakat like in Ramadan where we know that it's on the history calendar, a lot of people do it on, on the yearly Gregorian. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Which is off by ten days, yeah. and then I'm almost done. Yeah. Um, so then the zakat is kind of like off kilter after you know several years. Of, yeah, of pain. yeah. You're supposed to look at your the same day every year, and you can just do it on the first of Ramadan. But you know, my company has United Way, so I just whatever has to happen, you just do it and it's monthly. Mm -hmm. I know talking to nonprofits, they want to see monthly donations, mm -hmm. quarterly donations. They don't want to see one blip in Ramadan and they've got to scrap all year to try to see if it's going to last or not. So, so they, you know, a lot of nonprofits would like to see regular steady donations. So does that mean you're paying the year that passed or the, like? Yeah, you just, you just, you, you just take a benchmark and you up it. You know, so you look at how much you you because it's store of value, right? So if you have this many dates, if you have this much wealth in the past in your house at that date, then you've increased, and then you pay zakat on that. So I don't want to get too technical, but anybody can talk to Imam Tahir. He's a great resource. Um, okay, so we're here. So we've got vision, philosophy, and emotions, right? Socrates said this three thousand years ago: Know yourself. And the media is here to manipulate you so you don't know yourself, right? There's some amazing, amazing ads. I look at, I look at ads and I'm just blown away by them. I'm like, wow, what are they doing to me right now? I look at them because see the, see the media through the eyes of a Muslim. See the media through the eyes of somebody that's being manipulated. You know, a boxer knows when the guy fakes, he's going to come back with a punch. And the media is doing the same thing. It's exactly like that. If you're in front of a boxer, you're playing sports, you get set up with a jump hook to get you know, a shot. That's how every sport is played. This is the same sport. It's a sport. And you're, the guns are on you. You're a prey. Your wallet is what they want, right? And look at the credit card company, even their slogans. What's in your wallet, right? Do you have a cool credit card or do you have an average credit card? That's how they're playing with you. Okay, number two, internal agreement. Talk to each other and listen. So again, have a vision and then have agreement. <coughs> have goals. Get advice from someone who you both trust and admire. Get an unbiased perspective. Call a friend who you trust. Somebody who will give you good advice. Somebody who will really listen to you, not for the sake of they're nosy, but they want to actually help you. They're sincere. Set goals, strategies, and objectives together. You know, have, bring your kids in on this, you know. And plan and execute. Plan and execute, and remind and be kind. It's behavior is going to be fixed in four months. You're, if you're doing a budget together as a as a couple and family, you're not going to get it right month one. You're not going to get it right month two. You're not going to get it right month three. Inshallah, you get it right month four. It's trial and error, and you have to be kind. Because people have long term habits and, and and things going on that you have to try to undo, right? And that's what we've got to work on, is to try to do it together and be successful together. Um, let's see. I shared some interesting stories. So that's, that's how we go. Okay, so here's a couple other Dave Ramsey things. Sometimes you have to tell yourself no so you can later tell yourself yes. Right? So if you want to work for the community, you have your corporate job, but you pay off your house, you can be financially free to do something you love. Say no to yourself first so that you can say yes to yourself later. Inshallah, one day I want to retire. I want to retire but not sit on the couch. I want to retire and do something else. I might want to work with kids. I might want to, you know, help 
people, I might want to work in the mosque. I don't know, but at least if I pay my house off and I get my pension squared, my 401k squared, I have that flexibility. I'm not a slave to what I've got going on. I've got, I've got to do it until I'm 70. We make a joke at, you know, where I work. It's like the wheels are on the chair so that, you know, they wheel you out when you die, you know, because there are people who literally will not leave. And I ask people, like, you're so unhappy in your job. Why are you here? And there's two answers. I haven't met my financial goals, and I can't pay for medical benefits. Really, really old people. They shouldn't be at work. You know? There's a guy who was at PT 47 years. 47 years. He had a, he was a multimillionaire. He had a pension. You know, but he wanted more, and he didn't want to pay for his own medical benefits. They say, what are you doing? Like, you're unhappy every day. You come in my office and complain. You have nothing nice to say. Sorry. Please, leave my office. Let me work. He brings a different coffee cup every day. It's like the office, like a sitcom. Like, I see him, and I just get up and pretend I have to go to the bathroom, because I know it's like a recorder every day. Just come and ruin my day. You know, go home. You know, get close to God. Be with your children. You know? I don't want to listen to them. No, or maybe your children, you don't want to be, they don't want to be with you because you kicked them out and they're in debt. You kicked them out at 18 and they're in debt and you've got tons of money. I mean, I, I don't know. I've got to help people. All right. Some Warren Buffett quotes, Mr. Rich Guy here. Um, on savings, do not... Do not save what is left after spending, but spend what is left after saving. So his philosophy is, put the 20%, pay yourself first, before you pay everybody else. Okay? Put, put, he takes his income, 20% away, and then he lives on the 80%. 20%, 80%, 20%, 80%. After a while, man, you can do whatever you want. On spending, if you buy things you don't need, you may have to sell off the things you need. Okay? You're, you're, just, you're just renting your fund. You don't, have, you don't own anything. Okay? On earnings, never depend on a single income. Make in investments that create a second source. So again, if you're not a saver, you're not going to play a second source. Okay? That's like when we talk about the stocks. Yep. Yeah. Investments, right? You make money while you sleep. Inshallah, if it's in your risk. And the people are like, well, you know what? I'll find the perfect job. I'll sit at home. No, go work at Target and get some experience. It's tie your camel and trust in Allah. They forget the tie your camel part. Like, get up and do something. So work at Target? No, work and save. Don't sit at home like, oh, I have a master's degree. That's beneath me. But then you're in debt. You're sitting at home and you got holes in your resume. You might meet somebody out there. One of my directors at pg &E, he couldn't get a job, so he, he was a toll, he was a toll guy at Golden Gate Bridge, and he had, he made 2,000 copies of his resume. And he said to everybody in the car, this is a true story, he said, I'm looking for work, I'm an engineer, can you help me out? And, you know, 1,000 people a day ignored him. And somebody would be like, yeah, give me your resume. He'd be like, slip my resume. And he got a call. He started, he got a call. The guy said, I have a job, come work for me, I'll call you. Got a job, you know, started working in this engineering firm, then he got a job at PG&E, now he's a director. But that was his story. He said he started off as a toll, a toll taker, and he started giving out his resume. Work is work. Work is work, and you're getting out and meeting people. You know, and now it's the opposite. Before it was like you had to be online to get a job. Now there's all these apps and systems that are like bombarding you with thousands of resumes a day. pg e our company gets 120,000 resumes a year. That was five years ago. Imagine how many resumes we get. We only have 20,000 jobs. 120,000 resumes a year. How do we even process that? So you got to know people. you got to do some work. On investment, do not put all your eggs in one basket. That's pretty cliche. Uh, risk, never test the depth of the river with both feet. So, Can you stand on that? Meaning you don't, you don't go all in. You, 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 you rely on trusted sources. Have you guys heard of the grandmother's investment? There's this uh, investment uh, club that these grannies started back in Florida. And they're all, you know, grandmothers 
pinching their pennies and everything, and they invested in things that made sense. So they're like, oh, I like orange juice. I'm going to buy Nabisco stock. I buy this. My daughter had a kid, so she's getting Pampers. I'll buy Pampers. So they just, they didn't use mathematical algorithms. They weren't an investment bank, but they banked on things that they knew about. Simple. They kept it simple, and they outperformed the market. They outperformed the market because they bought solid foundational stocks. They didn't buy, you know, yeah, of course, for every, um, let me tell you this story, for every, I think there was 3,000 venture capital investments in startups in the peninsula over a two-year period. Guess how many of them actually survived two years? I have 3,000. 19, right? So in the news, you're always being bombarded by the next, you know, Jeff Bezos and the next, you know, Steve Jobs, and the, but there's so many failures, right? Don't bet on things that aren't solid. And then the other one, this is a good one. When we were kids, we used pencils. Now that we are adults, we use pens. Do you know why? It is easier to erase the mistakes of childhood. We should be wary of making mistakes as adults. And your pen is what gets you into debt, right? You give your word to liability. You don't have the money. Right? They want your ink. There's a Volkswagen slogan on Christmas called Sign and Drive. Yeah. yeah? You ever heard of Sign and Drive? Yeah. Just come in, sign the paper, take your car, three months, no payment. I mean, they're trying to suck you in. they got to get those cars off the lot. Okay? It's, it's just poison. You can't fall for that stuff. All right? So this um, ends the discussion. Um, thank you for being here. I just want to make a dua that you know, Allah give us ilm and amal, Allah give us halal, healthy risk for our families that allow us to be generous. And Allah gives us iman, ihsan, and gives us health. And it's a beautiful community. I want to thank the board and I thank all of you for being here. And jazakallah khair. In fact, if you have questions, we can take some questions. If you want to talk to me offline later, I'm here for another little while. All right. Jazakallah khair. Thank you for coming Saturday night. I know I'm competing with other people. Jazakallah, I really appreciate it. Let's end with a dua. Inshallah. Allah give us that give us guidance to uh, keep our families protected and allow us to be physically, spiritually, and financially whole and strong and build stable families. And Allah guide us to stay away from the haram and stay in the hall and and and, uh, and raise our kids in a way that pleases Him and it's, it uses the example of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.